Dr. David uh, Peña Guzman uh, as part of the MA uh, uh, Humanities uh, Speakers uh, Series. Uh, the, Dr. Uh, Peña Guzman is a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Evolutionary Ecology and Ethical Conservation at Laurentian University, uh, working more specifically with uh, Professor Julia Crozier here. Uh, and he received his uh, PhD in philosophy from Emory University, specializing in 20th century European philosophy, uh, philosophy of science, and also the history of Western philosophy. Uh, he has an interest uh, also in political philosophy and environmental this uh, environmentalism. His research, his research sorry, has appeared in various journals such as Kiasmi International, the American Journal for uh, of Bioethics, and the Journal of Mixed Methods uh, Research. The title of his talk today is uh, "What Can Phenomenology Do for Environmental Ethics." Please welcome Dr. Peña Guzman. Well, thank you for showing up. Uh, I know there's a snow storm <laughs> coming our way uh, later tonight, so hopefully we won't get out of here too late. Uh, and thanks for the program uh, organizers for having me. My talk today is going to be um, about two fields of research that uh, interest me and that uh, direct some of my work. Uh, one of them is phenomenology, so I'll be talking a little bit about that, and the other one is ethics. And what I'm going to try to do in this talk is bring those two together vis-a-vis uh, -vis environmentalism, or um, specifically environmental ethics, to try to carve what I argue is a new way of thinking about environmental ethics that might get us out of some of the um, troubles that we run into with existing frameworks, uh, especially ethical frameworks, in the environmental uh, studies literature. So just, I'll say a few things about how I'm going to position uh, the presentation and the sort of intervention that I want to make. Uh, and then I'll jump into the actual meat of the argument in about five minutes. So this will be a five minute um, kind of framing mechanism for the talk. So there is an environmentalist divide or a divide internal to the environmentalist um, scholarship when it comes to, to, to ethics that that fundamentally falls on two, um, uh, two camps. So we have uh, what is known as the animal welfare framework for thinking about uh, ethics, specifically animal ethics. And in the briefest version of this framework, the object of ethical reflection, so the thing that we worry about when we engage in ethical inquiry, is particular animals. So this animal, this lion, this giraffe, um, and we worry about their suffering, we worry about their well-being, we worry about their welfare. Um, under this framework, um, we can incorporate various different traditions, um, such as the tradition that grows out of Bentham that worries specifically about animal suffering as the primary concern for ethical theory. But in some readings, we also get uh, the animal rights tradition that grows out of a certain utilitarian framework. Uh, but what defines this animal welfare framework um, is, again, that focus on particular individuals and the assumption that they are the object of ethical investigation. Now, another framework that we have, and this has created um, certain tension in uh, specific debates in environmentalist discourse, is the conservationist framework, which differs from the welfare framework in two specific ways. Uh, the first and most important one is that it shifts the object of analysis from particular individuals, again, no longer talking about this animal, this dog, this cat, uh, this mouse, uh, but it shifts it over to species and populations. So it kind of zooms out uh, in terms of its analytic framework and suggests that what we care about when we raise ethical questions about nature and the animal kingdom is protecting those larger objects. So sometimes it could be the case that we have to sacrifice some animals in order to protect a larger population or some form of species. Um, what worries con uh, conservationists, and you often find conservationists um, among professional ecologists and biologists, um, is species collapse and, of course, um, extinction vortex. Um, and the aim of a conservationist framework is often either to protect biodiversity, however that gets conceived, 
or to ensure that we bring back populations that are either endangered or on some form of disequilibrium uh, with the environment back to a relationship of equilibrium. Again, however that gets conceived, and there are different ways to think about this. Now, there is agreement, I think, among uh, most environmental ethicists and scholars that in relation to most environmental problems that we have today, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to animals, you need a combination of both of these approaches. When thinking about pollution, climate change, you name it, um, there is value in, to some degree, synthesizing the concerns of animals with the concerns of the species that they belong to or the larger populations that they belong to. However, there are cases, and you know, I call them hard cases simply because they're hard in this regard, um, where it seems like it's actually quite difficult, if not altogether impossible, to achieve that synthesis. So there are cases where one, as it were, has to put one's cards on the table and decide if one is going to be a welfarian or a conservationist. Uh, so for example, there are a lot of debates about the culling of predators in nature, um, specifically in relation to the protection of endangered species in the wild. Uh, should we do that or should we not? I think if you're a welfarian, you're likely to say, no, you don't get to sacrifice wolves just because you want to protect caribou. I mean, the, the wolves themselves have some form of in intrinsic worth as individuals. If you're a conservationist, you might say, yes, but it's the population dynamics that really should worry us here. And so you end up falling on different sides of the debate. Um, you also get some tension between the welfareist uh, or the welfarian and the conservationist frameworks when it comes to questions about, for example, how to deal uh, with certain animals or species that have been either domesticated or that have been subjected to different forms of research. So what should we do with chimps that we have done research on that we no longer do research on but that cannot be rewilded? Um, I think some conservationists might say, well, since they can't be rewilded, you kind of have to take them out just because they cannot feed into those population dynamics that are important. Some welfareans might say, not so quickly. I think there are ethical concerns to be raised here in relation to the individual, to this chin or this bonobo. Um, you also get some of this tension between uh, the uh, welfarian and the conservationist approach in relation to the justifiability of zoos. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, there are a lot of concerns about animal welfare um, under conditions of captivity. And there's also a lot of concerns about the value that captivity holds for conservationist research and conservationist efforts. And so what I'm going to try to do, and I'm about to jump into the meat of the argument, as I said, is try to develop a framework that allows us to navigate between these two frameworks. Um, and I'm going to apply that new framework, which I call phenomenological ethics, um, to the question of uh, the contemporary zoo. So here we go. This is an outline of what I just said. So we can move on from this. Uh, propose an alternative framework, apply it to now, my argument here um, is going to have multiple, multiple moving pieces. So I begin by just uh, outlining, outlining two premises that I'm going to accept but not defend uh, in the presentation. So they're kind of background assumptions that I bring to the table that we can talk about during the Q&A if um, people have questions about them. So the first premise that I just kind of posit is that, is that there is a certain logic to what a zoo is meant to do to what the zoo does. And in her 2005 book, uh, Zoos at Philosophical Tour, Kiko Lee refers to this logic as immuration, which she defines as the practice of confining animals to enclosed areas without the intent of domesticating them. So when you think about ultimately what does the zoo do, the answer, at least according to the scholar, is immuration, the activity of bringing animals under walls without the intent of domestication. So that's what would make it different, for example, to have a certain animal in a zoo and to have a certain animal in your home. It's that intent of domestication. There is no uh, domestication ambition in the zoo. And I think this is, uh, for the most part, true in terms of the self, uh, true in terms of the self-understanding of zoo managers and zoo experts. They don't really want to domesticate. So there is a difference there. Now, the second premise upon which my argument is going to rely 
is the idea that there has been a shift in how zoos understand themselves. Um, starting in the middle of the 20th century, zoos underwent a relatively dramatic transformation. Um, Iris Bramerman, uh, who is uh, an expert on zoos and law and biopower, um, speaks of a paradigmatic shift. Uh, and she says, well, in the 19th century, zoos had this self-understanding as sites of entertainment and um, education. So people went to the zoo, and here you can think about those old zoos in Europe in the 19th century, in Vienna, in London, um, where they brought wild nature directly into the heart of the city. And the idea was that uh, Victorians would come up uh, to these animals and kind of enjoy themselves, get a break from the alienation of city life, and learn something about nature along the way. So in the 19th century, the core values of the zoo were education and entertainment. But over the course of the 20th century, there is a shift where zoos move away from that self-understanding, and they start seeing themselves in a new light. And the things that come to the fore as uh, the values by which zoos themselves justify their social existence become conservation and research. So there is this shift, again, from education and entertainment to conservationist efforts. So that even if today you go to any average, um, to any zoo, um, either to the actual place or to their website, you will see a lot of environmentalist rhetoric that is framed primarily through the concept of conservation. In the about a section of most websites for zoos, they all define themselves as vectors for conservationism as the modern way in which we conserve nature. Now, what I'm going to do in my presentation is challenge this self-understanding of zoos as places for conservationist efforts. And I'm going to argue that because the contemporary zoo remains trapped, as it were, in the logic of immuration that drove the creation of the world's first zoos, it is constitutionally incapable of conserving animal populations in any meaningful sense. So I'm going to try to take a relatively uh, ambitious stab at that self-understanding of today's zoos. In what follows then, I outline some of the ways in which the, the logic of capture and immuration takes a toll on the lives of animals, how it alters everything from their behavior as organisms to their evolutionary integrity as species. And I argue that the problem with the zoo is not, as welfarians argue, that they simply harm animals by depriving them of basic rights or basic principles like the, uh, the principle of bodily integrity, but also that they fundamentally transform and deform these very animals in a very deep and, as I will argue, almost ontological sense. So the ontological element is going to be part of my phenomenological contribution. Um, and this transformation that happens to these animals in the zoo is so deep and so uh, significant that it's ultimately unclear what zoos really conserve. Individuals, populations, or as I will suggest, only a shadow of both. In my view, immuration alters and often destroys the very phenomenological schemas through which experience is disclosed for non-human animals. As such, zoos can no longer be viewed, as some people argue, as our last common I'm sorry, as our last connection to a quickly vanishing natural world. Rather, they are the first step toward the vanishing of animal worlds themselves. So I'm going to argue that something quite sinister happens in the zoo relative to these structures that animals have in order for them to have a meaningful and coherent experience of the world. The body of research on zoos' impact on, impact on animals is relatively large. Ecologists, conservation biologists, geneticists, ecologists, zoologists, paleontologists, sociologists, and even humanists have written at great, at great lengths about the effects of captive life on animal welfare. Animals have been shown to exhibit a series of behavioral pathologies that are causally connected to conditions of confinement including what are called stereo, uh, stereo, stereotypes or stereopathies that suggest a collapse in the organism's very relationship to the environment. Stereotypes or stereopathies are behavioral patterns in human, in human and non-human animals that arise as direct responses, some people say coping mechanisms, 
to situations of extreme discomfort, debilitating stress, and sustained lack of environmental arousal. Classic examples of stereotypes among human beings include the back and forth rocking movement of people who have been institutionalized for a long time or who live um, on the autism spectrum, which is called stimming, again, this kind of rocking back and forth movement. Uh, the, re the repetitive and non-contextualized vocalizations of individuals kept for long periods of time in solitary confinement. Um, so there are cases where people have to make these vocalizations that just don't make any meaning or any sense, and they just have to do it, and they, they don't have any control over that, so we call that a stereotype. It's kind of just like a behavioral loop that can't quite be broken up by um, rational deliberation on the part of the subject. Stereotypes in human beings can be either verbal or nonverbal. They can involve simple or compound motor movements, and they can be either primarily physical or they can be social. Other examples of stereotypes in human beings include echolalia, which is the repeated repeating of what one hears. So there are cases where if there's a breakdown in an organism's relationship to the world, a human being, they have to just repeat anything they hear in order for it to register as real. So it's almost like a compulsive repetition uh, at the level of language. There's also polydipsia, which is uncontrollably drinking of water to the point where you're satisfied that you can't stop and just drink water all the time. And an irrepressible urge to mouth inedible objects and what is known as marching in place. Empirical research suggests that zoo animals experience um, or develop extreme stereotypes just like human beings would on account of being unable to project themselves onto an environment in a normative fashion, i.e. on account of being unable to project in a way that is meaningful and efficacious. Being confined to suboptimal spaces that do not reflect their natural environments and that frustrate their normal behavioral tendencies, animals of all kinds develop stereotypes that in many cases are so severe that, as one commentator puts it, quote, they resemble those of a range of clinical conditions, including autism, schizophrenia, mental retardation, and organic brain damage in human beings, end quote. For example, captive giraffes develop oral, oral stereotypes in which, they, in which they like, I'm sorry, in which they lick and bite non-food objects during the day and night. So uh, under captivity, they spend a lot of time uh, of their uh, waking hours and sometimes waking up in their sleep uh, during the night to just start they, to just eat things that are not edible and they do this all the time. Uh, sows and horses frantically chew at the bars of their enclosure, um, especially their metal bars that are vertical for some reason. They just start biting at them, which causes all kinds of dental problems and psychological problems. But again, they don't stop. It's almost as if it's a mechanical response that they just kind of act out on account of their conditions of existence. Parrots have been known to pluck themselves until they bleed and sometimes die. And big cats pace around their cells in, which, in what some field research, researchers I'm sorry, can only describe as trance-like patterns of behavior. So they just kind of walk around without really seeming to be aware of their environment in any real sense. The same thing happens with elephants. Elephants, which under normal conditions walk up to 50 miles daily, display repetitive and almost neurotic pacing in both circus and zoo establishments. This explains some of the well-known health problems they develop in captivity. Foot diseases, arthritis, weight-related diseases, infertility, heightened aggression, and other neurotic behaviors. Elephants also develop a complex multimotor stereotype that is so specific and so severe that it has its own name. It's called weaving, which is a combination of body, head, and trunk swaying. So if you've ever seen a video of an, uh, of an elephant that kind of does this sort of movement when it's standing, um, that's, that's weaving, and you don't see that in nature at all. So it's a behavior that only uh, arises under conditions of captivity, and you see it all the time in uh, zoos and circuses. A 2006 ethological study found that pacing and weaving can take up to 53% of an elephant's waking hour. And a 1991 study found that in polar bears, another zoo favorite, uh, this number of this uh, uh, pacing and weaving, which also happens with polar bears, jumps to 70%. So 70% of their waking time is spent just doing this movement, back and forth, back and forth. 
Polar bears also develop spatial stereotypes like cats and elephants. They walk in circles at exact intervals in the same number of steps without missing a beat. They also have been observed to swim in endless circles until exhaustion finally kicks in. In primates, stereotypic and stereopathic behavior can be more intense, primarily because of the social element and the cultural element of their lives. Chimpanzees eat their feces, which is called coprophagy, while gorillas deliberately regurgitate food only to then eat it again, regurgitate it again, and eat it again. Gorillas and chimps, uh, and chimps of course are our closest, uh, our closest allies in the natural world in terms of at least genetic resemblance, also develop a wide range of autoimmune disorders and pathological self relationships. It is almost as if, and this is my suggestion, that confinement in a zoo space twists these animals inside out or folds them onto themselves in a very strange way that prevents a healthy interface between inner and outer nature. The best evidence for this is that other-oriented behavior of chimps in the wild, the so behavior that they do with others uh, in nature, becomes self-directed behavior under captivity. Zoo and laboratory chimps often display self-grooming, self-directed genital contact, and self-motion play. Now, it is not only merely the fact of being captive that, in my view, deracinates animals from their world. It is also the presence of human observers, which again is what defines the zoo as a space, the fact that people go there to view and see the spectacle of animality. Certain animals, like cheetahs, experience being on display for human observers as an acute source of stress. A recent study shows that being on display triggers an adrenal, an adrenal cortical stress response in cheetahs that causes the adrenal glands to expand thus subjecting the animals to high levels of stress. Researchers found that stress level of cheetahs in captivity are much higher than stress levels in wild cheetahs. Curiously, they also found that stress levels were much higher in cheetahs that were captive and on display than in cheetahs that were captive and off display, thus suggesting a direct causal link between being under the gaze of a human observer and the expansion of the adrenal glands. One theory, and it is the dominant one in relation to cheetah research, is that cheetahs cannot differentiate the experience of being seen by humans from the experience of being hunted by them. Thus, cheetahs on display in the zoo may be said to be living in a specific and particular form of hell, living at the experiential precipice of death at every moment, under the constant fear of being hunted without anywhere to hide, without anywhere to run. Similar results have been found in other species such as armadillos, clouded leopards, and black rhinoceroses. Now, I propose that we consider the collapse, for example, of behavioral plasticity and sometimes evolutionary integrity, although I haven't talked about that in this presentation, as effects of what I call ontological violence. And this is a term that I'm going to be talking about for the next five to 10 minutes. I borrowed the term from Lisa Gunther, who in her 2013 book, Solitary Confinement, Social Death and Its Afterlives, mobilizes at this concept of ontological death in order to make sense of the effects of solitary confinement on human prisoners and their experience of the world. As she writes in the opening paragraph of the introduction to this book, quote, there are many ways to destroy a person, but one of the simplest and most devastating one is to prolong solitary confinement. Deprived of meaningful human interaction, otherwise healthy prisoners become unhinged. They see things that do not exist and fail to see things that do. Their sense of their own body, even their fundamental capacity to feel pain and to distinguish their own pain from that of others, erodes to the point where they can no longer where they're no longer sure if they're being harmed or if they're, being, or, or if they're harming themselves. Not only psychological or social identity, but the most basic sense of identity is threatened by prolonged solitary confinement. As Jack Henry Abbott wrote in his memoir, in The Beast, Letters from Prison, quote, solitary confinement can alter the ontological makeup of a world. This most basic sense of identity that Gunther identifies emerges from and is made possible by 
those phenomenal logical schemas that allow all human subjects to have a meaningful and coherent experience of the world. The schemas of space and time, the schema of a coherent inner outer distinction, the, uh, the schema of a meaningful relationship to one's own body, and the schema of, high, of healthy intersubjective types of recognition. So I view all these as the background conditions that need to be in place in order to have, a, again, a coherent experience of the world. And under solitary confinement, according to Gunther, it's those background conditions, those schemas that kind of cave in or collapse. When these schemas get crushed under the pressure of solitary confinement in the case of human prisoners, the result is what Gunther describes as becoming unhinged, losing one's very ability to, as it were, hook onto a world. My claim is that imprisonment, in the form of immuration, has a similar impact on non-human animal subjects that imprisonment, in the form of solitary confinement, has on human prisoners. It doesn't merely eat away at their psychological and social lives. It actually splits apart their phenomenological lives as well. To be clear, my concern is not so much that the modern zoo harms animals by making their lives uncomfortable or by taking away some of the rights that belong to any and all morally sentient beings in the world, like the freedom of movement or the right to liberty. My concern is that, in a very real sense, the zoo prevents animals from having a world in the first place. Immuration brings about a comprehensive breakdown in those most basic schemas of animal experience, in those structures, forms, or functions that are the necessary conditions for the possibility of experience itself. And here, I will focus only on two um, schemas to make this analysis a little bit more concrete. Uh, animal time and animal space. So let's begin with time. Many animals that roam in zoos normally move large distances over periods of time. And they have rhythms of life that are connected not only to their social lives, but also to the specific ecological determinations of their niche. For many of them, therefore, a trip to the zoo is not simply a change in the pace of life or a slight alteration in their mode of living, but a radical uh, reconfiguration of their very experience of time. Research on polar bear welfare, for example, has shown that the meticulous regimens that they're subjected to at the zoo, from highly regulated routines of eating, dieting, sleeping, and mating, disrupt their natural cycles of existence, causing them to experience stress and exhibit some of the stereotypes that I mentioned already. In a 2015 article published in Evolutionary Application, um, another member of the SEEK team, Albrecht um, uh, Schulte-Holsted, uh, and Gabriela Mastromonaco uh, argue that many animals, such as polar bears, are affected by what they call shifts in photoperiodism. Polar bears are used to living in latitudes in which, for a long period of the year, much of the day is dark, so there isn't a lot of sunlight, so they have very particular rhythms over the course of the day, and of course seasonal time as well, because of the latitude that they inhabit. Switch to zoos in other regions, it is not only temperature that becomes an issue, but also light itself, and this is almost impossible to control for, the amount of light that these animals get. This has a series of effects on melatonin levels, which controls behavioral patterns and reproductive cycles, and that, can and that can disrupt an animal's circadian rhythms. Under captivity, these animals have, quite literally, a really hard time. They have difficulties with the flow of lift time itself. They are forced to live in a time frame, a, a, a frame of temporal existence, that is not their own, and that they can only experience in terms of breakdown, failure, and ruin. Making matters worse is that, according to Schulte uh, Holsted and Master Monaco, the problem here goes beyond the individual polar bear. Evidence suggests that photoperiods, again, those cycles and rhythms that these animals have in terms of the day and the season, may be heritable in polar bears. If so, it is not only that polar bears in captivity are maladapted to the rhythm of life and seasonal time, but it, it is also that their offspring inherit this fundamental maladaptation such that over the course of only a couple generations, 
the captive animals are no longer able to reproduce with their wild clone specific. This, in my view, raises the question of what exactly the zoos really conserve. So if you have an animal like a polar bear that no longer has even the same kind of temporal rhythm that defines what polar bears do, and that moreover passes them, uh, those on to the species such that its offspring can't reproduce with its wild clone specifics, you know, surely you can serve a number of animals, but I want to suggest that in some sense there is only a shadow of the polar bear that remains inside the zoo. Um, space. By definition, captivity requires spatial entrapment. And while there have been efforts over the last 60 years to make the captive field more enriching for animals, this has not and cannot change the fundamental fact that animals are, for lack of a better term, jailed by their human keepers. They are simply not free. And this imprisonment often tears us under animals' experience of space. We have already seen in our analysis of, stereo of stereopathies how space, in a sense, shrinks for many of these animals. How it goes from being an open horizon in which animals can act and live and project to being a tiny little loop in which they get jammed, an infinite repetition of the same, what I call an eternal deja vu. The animal just walks in circles, going through the same spatial kind of experience over and over again. So space, in terms of the experience of space, not the objective space, also, although that's also the case, experiential time shrinks. Animals' lived experience of space is further distorted by the fact that the objective space they inhabit, when all is said and done, is a human one through and through. Critical analyses of zoo architecture over the last 80 years show that the spatial organization of zoos is driven not by concerns over animal well-being or flourishing, but by the demands of human enjoyment. In a 2007 article entitled Defining Issues of Space in the Zoo, Peter Stroud argues that the meta-norm, so the, the principle regulating everything, the meta-norm used in zoo habitat design is quality of experience. But by, the, by this is not meant the quality of the experience of animals, but the quality of the human visitors. This argument is echoed by Tony Axelson and Sarah May, who argue that the spatial organization of zoos reflects human cultural values more than animal needs with the viewer's satisfaction taking uh, precedence above all else. Moreover, the question that has historically guided zoo architecture is always an economic one. An incarnation of the max of, I'm sorry, an incarnation of the min-max principle of rationality in economics. What are the minimum number of requirements that we need to meet in order to accommodate the maximum number of species given the limited space that we have? Right, this is the question that is posed to those who construct the blueprint for the zoo. Thus, from the very beginning, animals lose their animal spatiality because they are forced to dwell in spatial registers that are little more than expressions of principles of human taste in design and principles of human rationality in construction. They are forced to live in stylized and rationalized spaces that are unnatural to them and that consequently denature them. Hence, again, rather than opening up a field of possibilities, pro uh, projects, and potentialities, the space that is the zoo, the space in which these animals live, closes these possibilities, these projects, and these potentialities off for, for these animals, leaving them unable to synthesize a coherent experience of the world in which to live out the drama of their lives, leaving them, as Heidegger, a German philosopher, would put it, world poor, or poor in world. Now, let me bring this now back to just a conclusion uh, in relation to animal ethics, which is how I uh, began the conversation. I here have focused primarily on two schemas of animal experience, time and space, uh, but the argument can be expanded to various other forms of, of schemas. Uh, so, for example, we can talk about sociality and the social animals, we can talk about the relationship to the body and the way in which animals kind of, their own body often becomes alien to them under conditions of confinement, the way in which embodiment kind of collapses. Um, 
And depending on one's kind of phenomenological commitment, you can study various kinds of uh, phenomenological schemas. If you think, for example, that animals have spiritual lives, maybe that, spirit, that, that schema of spirituality also breaks down. If you think that animals have certain other capacities, then you can do the, the concrete research and make an argument for that. Um, but again, I here focus only on animal time and animal space because they're you know, something that we can agree most animals have. Most animals have a sense of time. They have an experience of space that is, that is species specific. Now, the importance for ethics of this whole approach, uh, so returning again to that original framing that I uh, began with, is that, in my view, paying attention to the ways in which animal schemas, whatever those may be, however they may be construed, uh, are affected by human activity, and not only zoos, here we again can expand the framework to other forms of human activity, um, gives us I think, a new way of thinking about environmentalism and specifically animal ethics because these schemas can function as normative guides for ethical reflection. So this is the argument that I'm advancing relative to ethical theory. We can assess, in other words, the ethical justifiability of different forms of human action from zoos to aquariums to pollution to climate change to practices of domestication by asking a fundamentally different question than the one posed by welfarians and conservationists. So I really want to literally change the conversation a little bit. Rather than asking, does this activity affect sentient beings in a negative way? Does it make them suffer? Uh, does it make them sad? Which I take to be relatively restrictive because you would have to get rid of most human activity. And rather than asking, as the welfare, I'm sorry, as the conservationists would ask, does this activity help us conserve species at some point down the road, which I take to be highly permissive because you can always make an argument for anything on those grounds, I think we should ask a fundamentally different question. We ought to ask, does this activity have a discernible impact on the ontological structures of animal experience? On the ontological structures that make possible the experience of these animals, the animals affected by that activity? If so, I think there are grounds for an abolitionist position on both welfarian and conservationist grounds. So we can say, no, we ought to abolish the zoo because the impact on these ontological structures not only harms the animals, so that's a welfarian concern, but it also harms them to such a degree that it actually problematizes the conservationist defense for that practice, which is what I have suggested in relation to so here those schemas become the kind of norms that we apply um, to say up to here, but no more. This approach to environmental theory and practice, I argue, carries two values. One, unlike Wolfarian ethics and animal rights approaches, it bypasses, for example, the question of whether or not animals have rights, which leads to all kinds of debates relative to legal theory that I don't even think we need to entertain while retaining the normative power that normally comes with, with rights discourse and that we need for any robust ethical theory. So it, again, it allows you to say, once you breach this norm, you have entered the domain of that which is unjustifiable. So it has normative bite. And second, unlike conservationism, this phenomenal logical ethical approach is relatively restrictive. So it does allow us to say, in relation to concrete practices, this far and no more, which I don't think the, the conservationist approach really allows you to do very well. It holds this approach that some human activities are fundamentally ineffective as conservationist strategies if they affect organisms at an ontological level, even if they manage to keep members of a species alive for a short or a long period of time. So again, it doesn't matter if a number of animals are alive inside the zoo once those species-specific schemas or functions have broken down. At that point, I think the conservationist defense kind of gets vacuous and it gets thrown out. Moreover, and this is uh, where I will close, I think that this approach of phenomenological ethics allows us to combine humanistic and scientific inquiry in a relatively interesting and productive way uh, because we can use the tools of uh, the humanities, in this case, uh, phenomenology, uh, interpretation, uh, analysis of animal experience, and combine that with concrete empirical research coming from the sciences, 
uh, because you need both in order to make these arguments about animal experience. Um, in order to assess when experience breaks down and at what point it breaks down to such a degree that we might meaningfully speak of ontological violence. Um, and uh, once we get to that bottom level, again, it gives us a resource to make a normative claim in favor of an abolitionist position relative to whatever human practice. So I'll end there, um, and I hope it was roughly within the time frame. Uh, it didn't bring a time, but thank you. Thanks, David, for sharing your presentation with us. Uh, and we have time for a question. Thank you for the presentation. I, I, I'm curious, but this is a relatively minor point of your argument, but uh, it's just my scientific curiosity. You talk about the uh, polar bear's time schedule is inheritable? <laughs> no, not the schedule. The, uh, or the, 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 the cycle? Or yeah, the photo periods. The, the, period. the, the rhythms of animal life relative to uh, levels of light and the dynamics with melatonin. So it's genetically determined, you mean? Uh, well, it can be passed, it would have to be passed down through uh, some form of genetic information from a uh, parent so, and child. So how does the parent's experience or, or, mm. or screwing up the parent's cycle affect the next offspring if it is genetically inherited? Uh, yeah, just curiosity, I'm not challenging. Yeah, no, I mean, I understand that it sounds like weird uh, Lamarckianism coming in. <laughs> um, and uh, there is a difference here. It's not the experience that gets passed on to the children. It's actually the effect on those fundamental functions. And this is the research of um, Albrecht uh, 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 and uh, Master Monaco. Um, and they make the argument that the research suggests that it's, again, the organism cycle, but however that, I don't know the specific science of the genetics there, uh, that gets passed on. So there's a way in which the impact of environmental conditions has an effect, and here, you know, I, I think some division of labor is fine. Um, the, the scientists would have to get the details of how the transmission happens. Uh, but in light of certain recent developments in genetics in the, since 1960s that suggest that uh, you know, environmental factors could have some indirect uh, impact on the genome that then the, the, on the germline that then gets passed. Uh, so the relative, like, quick return of Lamarck into uh, biology since 1960s. Again, the science I don't know. That is the case if the next generation get back to the intended environment of the bear, the, the, the gene will go back to the original. So some are secure than others, so like some of them be passed up for like multiple generations. So yeah, the biologist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that, that, we think that that's how, um, like for example, uh, stress levels um, when um, snowshoe hares are pregnant and there's really high predation by the lynx then uh, stress levels of those pregnant mothers will be sort of imprinted on their offspring. And then you see this population sort of start to collapse along with the predation. And then um, you have all these offspring that are born in under low predation. They have kind of a, a different imprint on their genetic code. Then if they start to take off again, and then the links kind of catch up with them. And that's, it's, it's thought to be part of the way that they cycle. So yeah, yeah. it's this idea that it's kind of, it can go back and forth. Yeah, yeah over the course of a couple yeah, of years. If that is the case, in some way, the shoe can still preserve the polar bear once they return the polar bear's offspring back to nature. It just takes time for the gene to return to to certain pattern that will that will allow the animal to fit into the environment. Well, the problem is that according to this research, once you um, the second generation of animals under captivity, once you reintroduce them into the wild. Of course, they can potentially live a full and healthy life, but if there has been a significant enough change in their uh, photo periods, they can no longer reproduce. Um, and so they don't even pass their genetic material on 
Um, and so again, the question there is, did anything get conserved? So it's a the philosophical argument about the conservationist um, kind of self-understanding of the zoo. Um. The question about um, method and how essential the phenomenology part is to your analysis. So in the case of, of humans, if we keep things within the species, the generalization from my experience to human experience um, is it can be problematic. So it's a, it's a move that has to be defended. And it's a, it's a move where we could make mistakes. Um, and there's probably greater sensitivity to the possibility of mistakes in this matter today than there were, than, than there were at the time, at, at Husserl's time, uh, perhaps. But so the question I have is this. When we speak about the lived experience of animals, as opposed to what we can see of their behavior, um, how can we be sure if they're, if we have reason to suppose that their lived experience is different, so that would count as an ontological change, that, that it's different and worse, and not different and better, or different and just uh, non-comparable. So I think, for example, humans change their environment. Uh, so people that are coming to Canada from right now from temperatures that are 100 degrees to temperatures that are minus 10, and <coughs> adjusting and accommodating, and, and put all things together, you know, so, so tremendous changes. Whether whether it's better or not better or something, can be hard to say. So there's a, a, a there's a value judgment that the change itself is bad. And I can see that it's bad from the, if the object is simply conservation of whatever it is, then change is bad because it's, it's not conservation. But from the animal welfare standpoint, at least, not necessarily so. So how, how do you... Um, how do you assess that better part? Uh, so this is a huge debate in evolutionary theory and the philosophy of evolution, whether you can make any value judgments uh, at the evolutionary level. Um, and it's a debate that, in my view, kind of bottoms out. Um, so, you, and so it's very difficult to uh, take a position on this, because there are some people who just say, you know, evolution is just change, and change is change. So whatever change happens, insofar as everything is nature, stands already kind of in the domain of the natural, outside questions of better or worse. Um, so the value judgment here is not at the evolutionary level. I'll turn to the animal welfare in a minute. The value judgment here about the change is not a value judgment about the change in the species. So it could be that maybe if we have polar bears that change under captivity and then we just kind of reproduce them without somehow leading to uh, population collapse, that you know maybe they, it becomes a different species and that's fine, that's just change, that's speciation. So the value judgment is not necessarily there. The, the value judgment here is in relation to the self-understanding of the zoo. So I'm going after the zoo institution uh, and I'm making a value judgment of that through, by, by holding that institution accountable to its own self-understanding. You think you're doing this, but you're not. Um, and so I do kind of want to move away from the question about whether, you know, like, are extinctions bad? It, it, they happen all the time, you know, or is any kind of evolutionary change bad? Difficult to make that argument. Um, so I'll circumvent that question a little bit. Uh, when it comes to animal welfare, um, you're making roughly the same question. How do I know that this is bad for the animals? Yeah, and, and there you are saying that, because you're, you're saying it harms it's harmful. Yes, and this is the question about method. So there certainly is a risk, methodologically speaking here, about anthropomorphizing animals, kind of projecting my experience onto them, which is also a risk between humans and internal to the human species. However, I think that I mean, there's a, a, a term that is meant to capture the opposite of that, which is anthropofabulation, 
um, which I saw recently in the literature, meant to capture this idea that I cannot make any inferences about other species because whatever I have is only mine alone. Um, and the ways in which maybe that doesn't quite hold. Now, in terms of method, the, the critical part here will be to distinguish between the content and the form of experience. So I certainly cannot make inferences about the content of animal experience. As Thomas Nagel puts it, you know, I will never know what it's like to be a bat. Like, I just will never know. I don't have wings, I don't have echolocation. I cannot even begin that process of analogical reasoning. However, I think that there is a way of making some inferences about the conditions for the possibility of animal experience, even if I myself am not an animal. And here is where the empirical research can make us, can help us make, and you know, it's not direct, it's not objective, there's always some level of interpretation in this kind of research, because it is not, you know, it, it it's phenomenology, it's not science. Um, but there is a way in which we can use empirical research to make indirect uh, inferences, which is what, for example, Berlou Ponty does in the phenomenology of perception. He says, well, I don't have, you know, I want, he wants to talk about the phenomenology of certain um, illnesses, um, illnesses where people lose the ability to speak coherently, they can't differentiate between different sensory modalities. He doesn't have that condition, but by looking at the empirical research, he says, Look at all these symptoms that this subject is having. How can we explain them except by positing this underlying structure that allows them to appear and that we see in the fact that it's collapsed? Uh, so this is the methodology of you know, a lot of, for example, experimental medicine. What's the function of an organ? You see it. You come to that function only when you see the organ kind of start breaking down. And you start seeing the symptoms and the effects. So it's a similar methodology where we can say, we look at the animals, we don't make inferences about the content of their experience, I don't know what it's like to be a polar bear, never will, but perhaps by looking at their behavior and their pathologies and um, their symptomatology, I can make inferences about something fundamental that goes wrong, like space being an open possibility, um, you know, being something that leads animals to project themselves but they no longer can do that. Uh, time breaking down in a fundamental way that we don't see uh, in the wild con specifics. Um, so I hope that answers to some degree the question about method. Uh, but it is indirect and it is not just, uh, it, this is not an empirical project because it does have that element of, kind of philosophy and interpretation and judgment. And I think when it comes to animals, even though we can be wrong for sure, um, there are some cases where we can just say, I think it's almost, I don't want to say obvious because it's not obvious to everybody, uh, but I think it's pretty safe to say that the change for these animals, for the individual animals at the level of welfare is bad. Like for the cheetahs that are constantly under this expansion of the adrenal gland, they cannot possibly experience that as a good. Um, it's just the normalization of the pathological for them. So, but in the case of the conservation argument, the very fact that there's change is enough to make the argument there against the zoo. The M on the animal welfare ground, it seems to me, you'd need to make the argument in each case based upon whatever empirical evidence that you have. Yeah, and I think so, that's true. So here I'm just beginning, this, you know, this is a brand new project for me, so I'm beginning only to figure out where I want to take it. But I think it's true, especially because the schemas that I'm talking about, I chose time and space because they seem to be widely shared among large numbers of species, but they are always species specific. That, you know, like the experience, the, the, the form of space and the way in which it's lived out will depend from species to species. Um, and it all depends on the dynamics of that species. So the um, species specific research is certainly part of this if it's going to go anywhere. It could be that I just lay out kind of like a skeleton framework, and then it has to be applied and filled in with highly concrete research, you know, by others or by myself at later points in time. Yeah. 
Um, so I think there are two sides to the question, which is this debate relative to the zoos and then this issue relative to my own uh, position. Um, you know, with the zoos, I think there is a good argument to be made on both sides about what the zoo is doing, uh, depending on how you define the zoo and what kind of things you bring into the discussion. So certainly, you know, it makes money. There is a whole management, um, governmental, like private investment dimension to zoos um, that serves human interests. Uh, and ultimately, the fact remains that the zoo is a place where people go because they find it of value to themselves in some way. That can be for education purposes or whatever the case may be. Uh, but there is also, I think, an argument to be made from the standpoint of the zoo keepers themselves who will say, look, what we're doing here is conserving some species because we think that they have intrinsic value. And we maybe want to release them back into the wild if you know, we succeed in our project. Um, so there, you know, that's a, a slightly different debate. Um, my own position tends to be always suspicious. <laughs> uh, so I would say, yeah, there is some human ends that are primarily served by the existence of the zoo. Um, and you could serve some of those ecocentric um, efforts, like preserving the inherent worth of this or that species, without having this kind of melodramatic representation of the animals in these glass cages, like that seems to me to be unnecessary. Um, so that's one side. The other side is about my own position relative to those um, uh, traditions. And that is that if I had to classify it in some way, um, the methodology is anthropocentric insofar as it's derived from a philosophical tradition that began as a study of exclusively human beings, phenomenology, the study of human experience. Uh, but in spirit, it would be um, ecocentric or nature-centric insofar as it holds that these functions or these schemas are something like the species good of those animals and that they need to be protected precisely because they are what is needed in order for that animal to be the kind of animal that it is. Uh, so it does have an ecocentric kind of um, orientation uh, and kind of like feeling to it, but it's that debate is not one that I I frame my research through, even though it's certainly there in the background. Can I have a question about the zoo? I'm just wondering how. Um, so a lot of zoos are moving towards maintaining captive breeding programs and. So my position on that goes a little bit beyond what I just talked about, but it would be maybe something like this. Imagine that you have a species, let's say, of panda bears, pandas that have been you know, in captivity for generations and generations to the point where we know they will not survive in the wild and they will not reintegrate into um, a naturally existing population of pandas. Um, so what should we do with them? Because in some way, my position could be interpreted as a deepening of the animal welfare position, where I'm saying, hey, welfare goes just beyond pain and suffering. It goes to this deeper level of what makes experience possible. It still gives us a ground to say, there's still a problem with immuration itself, so that the keeping of these animals in conditions of confinement is still, independently of whether they live out in the wild per se or not, an ethical problem. Um, and you know, in this case, a phenomenological problem as well. Uh, and there we might have to figure out, well, then what do we do? And I think that there are ways to go around this, uh, maybe somewhere in between, just like the, the very constrained immuration that happens in the zoo and just nature, maybe something like a sanctuary, 
where there is actually a, a broader uh, field of, of literal space for the animals to move, where they're in relationship with a whole ecosystem, where they're not being under the constant observation and control of human observers, where they can act out some capacities that, they're normal, that they wouldn't be able to under conditions of enclosure. So something like that. Um, because it is true that we have moral obligations to animals that have become dependent on us for survival. Um, and maybe this is also a place where I can start thinking about how this might help us think about other things like domestication, which is uh, you know, the non-zoo analog of, of this question. Well, this was actually So there we can say, so, okay, that's a difficult question, and I need to think about this one through. Um, my first kind of reaction would be to say that at least the, the criticism of the zoo institution would remain. In fact, this would be a warrant for that, because then you end up with these situations of hyper-domesticated uh, or um, you know, hyper-zooized uh, individual animals that can only live in this environment. Uh, then the question of what do we do with those that already exist, um, I mean, I would have to put this question off to some degree to like the experts on animal welfare. Uh, certainly, the first thing we would have to do is stop any forced breeding programs that we would have of these animals. Uh, maybe we wouldn't want to go the other end of the spectrum and uh, say sterilize them, because there are also ethical questions about that. Um, so if it could be that on their own, the animals, these animals have something akin to like an evolutionary integrity that can, like sustainability in evolutionary terms in a zoo environment, it could be that then we have an ethical obligation to maintain that space for those organisms. But then the burden would have to be on the zoo institution itself to show that any specific species can only exist in that space in order for it to have its kind of like green light for existence. And any animal that doesn't meet that criteria, you know, wouldn't be a, a candidate for zoo display. So the use, uh, you use the word of the 
perhaps also to include uh, other type of environments where humans are observed uh, from very close sometimes, such as in, in some national parks um, where we can literally go by car and go with bison and so on. Uh, so what would the phenomenologist think of these uh, national parks? Um, so I'll begin with the first one. Um, with phenomenology, um, you know, it started as a way of thinking about human experience. And the idea was that humans are not just input-output mechanisms, you know, that just react to the environment and respond, but that in some ways the subject is active in creating a meaningful world. Because we bring these kind of subjective forms, like times, you know, space, insert whatever you want here. Um, and so in extending that to animals, Implicitly, I'm suggesting that there are at least some animals, and we might also have a debate about where we draw the line, that are cognitively sophisticated to such a degree that we might say that they're active subjects in a philosophical sense. In the sense that they themselves construct a world of experience, and they're not just receiving data from the senses and reacting to that. Um, and so internal to the um, tradition of phenomenology, there has been an a trend, I think, over the last 10 years to think about environmentalism. Although, normally, it's done in terms of thinking, for example, about my experience of the natural sublime, or thinking about the ways in which I'm co-constituted by nature, or the way in which, say, my relationships with various animals that I am in, um, in various forms of relations with, you know, like, the way in which it enriches my life, or something like this. So, often, the, the anchoring point for the experience is still the human being. Um, and that's just because there is this risk that was mentioned before about, you know, you don't want to be the guy who publishes, like, the article, I know what it's like to be a bat. You know, like, that's just probably a bad idea. Um, and so there is hesitation about this risk of uh, anthropomorphizing animals or even um, kind of short-circuiting the natural scientists who might say, oh, these animals, you know, are not really, they, they're not subjects and we are experts. And then you have the philosopher saying like, no, I'm going to do the phenomenology of this animal. Uh, so there are all kinds of risks methodologically. Um, and when it's done, it's again done through the perspective of our relationship to animals and environments. And so what I want to do is again, through this kind of indirect inference making of the conditions of animal experience by looking at when they break down suggests that there is such a thing as animal phenomenology. Now, we may not be able to do an animal phenomenology. Again, we can't access the content of the animal's experience. Um, but it could be that we might be able to serve certain moral ends, like protecting animals, using this framework that allows us to present animals as active subjects who create a meaningful world and who and who can undergo something like ontological violence, um, which again is slightly different than just the violence you know, of like, I don't know, getting your hand cut or like getting a bruise. It's a fundamentally different kind. Uh, so it is a different trend that I'm trying to introduce. Uh, in relation to other environments, um, again, the, the research has to be done relative to each space and each species, uh, which is why the empirical research would be so important. Right? Like, I don't think a philosopher can just run and make grandiose claims about animality as such with this framework. And if I did, or if one did, it would be a problem. Uh, because so much of experience is species-specific, time-specific, and space-specific. So it could be that, for example, certain animals like buffalo thrive under some national, some national parks, and some don't. Um, or, or some other species doesn't in a national park. Um, and there, again, it would have to be the, the applied work that would make the difference. But in general, I think there would be um, at least a way of expanding this framework, even if very loosely, to talk about other spaces and other species. Because um, as far as the framework itself goes, there is nothing intrinsic to it that says, this is only for use in relation to zoos in the late 20th and early 21st century. Um, so that, that certainly can be uh, expanded and then kind of filled in with the specific research.
so much as I have something that I think you probably find really interesting. Um, I read a paper that was published in 2011 called Sounding Depth of the North Atlantic Right Whale and Merlot Ponte. And it's super interesting because it combines this phenomenal, like a phenomenological approach of like navigating human space with non non-human animal space in terms of depth as a category. So using this spatio-temporal phenomenological aspect and then using the right whale's experience of depth in a space to translate to human's experience of depth. So I feel like there's probably something that you can yeah, like because zoos have so many various components, right? So I mean, I feel like that could open because the person is trying to do the, a similar thing to you, where they're taking this like one aspect and then applying this phenomenological approach, and then saying this is how I'm going to contribute to environmentalist thinking or sustainability and actions like that. So I think it's a similar project to yours, except it's in the ocean instead of a zoo, but. Right, but I mean, I would ask you for the reference for sure to look it up. Uh, but this would be one example in which you get a sense of the degree to which it has to be species specific, right? Like, you can't talk about whale space, let's just call it that, the whale's kind of movement through space and what space means for the whale without talking about this category, depth, that maybe you don't need for something like a dog. Uh, maybe for a dog, distance or, uh, you know, there's all kinds of like markers that dogs do relative to space and olfactory senses. So again, space is constituted through different sensory modalities and in different ways relative to different species. Um, but yeah, there, that seems like it would be right up my alley at least. Other comments or questions? Just a quick comment since you mentioned the male yeah. article. Uh, maybe that article wouldn't be as weird or confused if instead of what it's like to be a bat, it was what it's like to be a chimpanzee. Um, maybe entirely it's the break with human. Right? So it doesn't matter if you go to what it's like to be a mosquito, uh, et cetera. Uh, I'm not sure. But it, it, I would say, though, that it's problematic even within the human species to do the paper of what it's like, you know, for me, what, what it's like to be a woman. Um, what it's like to be uh, something that I'm not, uh, but that's correct within me. So that I think that's a that's an issue within phenomenology that exists for traditional phenomenology. Right? It's a, it's a, it's a really it's actually a central problem, and that's why we use the concept of that analogy before. Um, but it, the anal the analogizing, or you might call it anthropomorphizing. Uh, may not be equally absurd for all uh, for all other species. I, I think I've got a pretty good sense of what my puppies are. But I'm not always sure what my wife is thinking. Right? So. <laughs> well, I mean, this is one of those um, I think real risks that can nonetheless be overblown. Uh, because, of course, you in the same way that you don't want to write that article, what it's like to be a bat, I will never write a book, you know, like, let me tell you what it's like to be a woman. All kinds of political red flags should be going up. Uh, and for good reasons, right? Like, because you cannot make inferences about the content of other people's experience in that way. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't talk about something like women's experience. And this has been, for example, the banner under which feminism has been rallied. And so what do you do? It's not that you reason by analogy, it's actually that you start listening. So again, you start looking at those subjects that have access to this experience, and then you start doing work of interpretation, and there are limits, and there are going to be obs obstacles and slip-ups, sometimes big ones. Um, but nonetheless, it's again that listening rather than analogical reasoning. And I think that we can also do that with animals. So it's not about reasoning by analogy. It's by looking to what we can learn about animals based on what they tell us, even if that telling is not propositional or linguistic in nature, right? Like the, the polar bear is not saying like, I am sad, but using just some form of common sense, some understanding about the way in which 
uh, these animals normally live, so comparisons with their wild home specific uh, can be useful. You can start to get a sense that, huh, this animal has been literally walking in circles in a space of 10 feet for you know, 70 percent of the day for about eight years that it's been in captivity. Maybe that's a sign. And so, the devil is in the details. Um, and uh, this is where a phenomenologist, in some way, has to enlist the help of somebody like an ethologist, like a professional animal behavior expert, which is where I would call for that collaboration. Um, and the, the only reason that I really want to emphasize that, um, that there are risks with that animological reasoning, but sometimes you don't want to give up on still talking about various kinds of experiences in this indirect way, is that if you limit yourself to only reasoning by analogy from your experience, like you said, even in the human case you can't do that, and so you end up embracing, whether you want to or not, sometimes just as a consequence of those commitments, a purely sol solipsistic philosophy, which was one of the accusations of Husserl, uh, or one of the charges against Husserl, that he wanted the systematic description of his experience, that he wanted that to be true of everybody. And then the problem is, well, you can't quite just literally map it onto somebody else, therefore only I exist. And you know, ethically and politically, um, that's a non-starter. Um, so maybe listening rather than analogical inference making is the better way to go. Thank you very much.